Welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today, man? I'm great, Nathan. How are you? I'm fantastic. I have loaded up on coffee right before the show, so I'm ready to go, man. <laughs> All right. So it's uh, it's Nathan and Hyperdrive. Okay. Well, for today, let's talk story. Okay. Experienced copywriters know that a story is the best way to introduce a product, bring a benefit to life, answer objections, do a whole lot of other things. Why is that? Because stories galvanize the attention of your prospect. A story reaches deeper into the mind of someone, deeper than any other form of communication. But somewhere along the way, Hollywood got in the way, as it has a habit of doing, enter the hero's journey. Now, the hero's journey is the go-to template for movies and other forms of fiction. As a result, a number of people started solemnly pro proclaiming that all stories and copies should be hero's journeys, only hero's journeys, and nothing but hero's journeys, so help you Hollywood. Well, there is only one problem with that idea. It's simply not true. I've just written a new book called the persuasion story code where I identify and explain 25 different types of stories that work, that are proven to work, not only in copy, but in all forms of persuasion, including face-to-face -face selling. And not one of them is the hero's journey. I'm going to tell you about the book and these kinds of stories today, but first I'm going to remind you that copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and or if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. Okay, so let's start with this idea. Persuasion stories are not entertainment. They're stories that get results. For example, a man walks up to the counter at the gate 10 minutes before takeoff. The flight is full and everyone before him has been screaming a blue streak at the flight attendant staffing the desk. No, she says to the man before he can say a word. I think I know what you're going through, the man says to her with a grimace. I manage a store downtown, and the last three days before Christmas, our customers are just like the people here. Rude, impatient, and they won't listen to reason. Sometimes you wonder why you took a job like this in the first place. The flight attendant looks at him for a few seconds. The hint of a smile dances at the ends of her mouth. May I see your ID, she says. He hands it to her. She types into the computer, prints out a boarding pass, and gives it back to him along with the ID. Then she says to him, almost in a whisper, we had a cancellation in first class. I'm upgrading you. Get on the plane now. Okay, so what did the man do? Either deliberately or more likely simply out of compassion, the man told the woman a story about what goes on in his store before Christmas and how he understood what she must be going through. And after she heard it, she changed her mind. She put him on the plane in first class. What he told her, whether he realized it or not, was a persuasion story. And probably to his great surprise, he got a seat on what he thought was a fully booked plane. Now, people tell stories like the man told all the time. Most of the time, people telling the story don't even realize it's a story and neither do the people hearing the story. This is what I call a persuasion story. They make up the engine of persuasion in sales letters and also in everyday life. I've identified 25 kinds of these stories and I've written a book about them called The Persuasion Story Code. Whether you are a copywriter or you use persuasion in some other way as part of your work, persuasion stories are something you need to know more about. That's what we'll talk about today. Um, before I go on, want to say anything? I I just want to say that I got a sneak peek at your book 
long before we're even recording this podcast and I'm so excited to see it come out because yeah, as copywriters, we tend to get stuck in the hero's journey over and over and over again. I was sleeping on my sister's couch and I had $50,000 in debt and then I discovered this secret and now I'm, I'm living the life of luxury with Lambos and I wanna give that secret to you. It's so played out. People are sick of it and man, you, I'm, I'm excited to get into the show because I saw the ones that you've got planned to release, but man, the, the whole book from beginning to end is just gold. So I'm just excited to get into it. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll take that as a testimonial. <clears throat> okay, so what is a persuasion story anyway? Well, to be sure, they don't have the normal characteristics of stories. They don't always have clearly defined beginnings, middles, and ends. They don't resemble the plots of movies, TV shows, novels, plays, or video games. And most important of all, they are short. The most important quality of a persuasion story is that it is something you say or something you write that involves people and feelings or actions or both, and they lead the person hearing or reading them to come closer to a willingness to agree. Dramatic stories are much longer and often attempt to teach universal life lessons about truth, responsibility, love, actions and consequences. Usually in a long and winding way, they tell a tale about how one person dealt with danger and ultimately emerged victorious or ended up in disaster. Persuasion stories, on the other hand, have a much narrower job to do, that is, to help create agreement, and usually to help make a sale. A big difference between dramatic stories and persuasion stories is this. A dramatic story costs you money to watch, to read, or to listen to. You have to pay for those things. Often money well spent, but nonetheless, they cost you money. A persuasion story makes you money. Sometimes you use one of these stories. Most of the time, you use a combination of them, like puzzle pieces, in a sales letter, in a VSL, or in a spoken pitch. You don't have to pay to tell them. You get paid for telling them. Let's look at a couple of really well-known stories about fighters to see the difference between the two types of stories more clearly. Here's a summary of one of the most famous stories about fighters in history. You're on a beach. It's summer. The breeze is cool and the sand is hot beneath your feet. You see a skinny young man with his beautiful girlfriend. A much bigger, stronger man comes up to them and kicks sand in the young man's face. The young man refuses to fight and the girl is totally unimpressed. She walks away. The young man decides this can't go on, so he orders a home study course about muscle building. The Charles Atlas course. <laughs> Later, at the same beach, the bigger, stronger man runs into the young man, who is now all bulked up. The young man kicks some serious butt, and his girl is all over him. Recognize that story? It's a one-page comic strip called The Insult That Made a Man Out of Mac. It ran in the back of comic books as an ad for more than 50 years all over the world. It's considered by many people as the most famous ad in history. The actual comic strip is all of 132 words in seven panels on one page. Now, here's the summary of another story about a fighter. You're in Philadelphia in a working class neighborhood. You see a young man who works as an enforcer for a local loan shark. And when he's not working, he puts on boxing clubs and he spars at a club. He's sweet on this shy girl who works at a pet shop. The girl's brother works at a meatpacking plant. It's America's Bicentennial, and as a publicity stunt, the world's greatest boxer picks, up the, cl picks the club boxer, happens to be named Rocky, and offers the young man a shot at his title. The young man accepts the challenge. In the fight, he goes 15 rounds with the world champion. It surprises everyone that he lasts this long, but the young man loses by a split decision of the judges. The story ends with the young man and the pet shop girl 
professing their love for each other. Of course, that's Rocky, the 1976 film, a two-hour movie made from a screenplay of 115 pages. In terms of number of words, if you looked at the printed screenplay and started to read it, you'd be halfway down the first page and already have read more words than you find in the entire Charles Atlas one-page comic strip. Moviegoers paid a collective $225 million to get tickets to watch Rocky. That's a lot of tickets and a lot of money. The important thing is people paid money to watch that story. The ad for Charles Atlas made untold millions of dollars for the company that was running it. It was not written by a screenwriter, but by a copywriter named Charles Roman. The story made his company a lot of money. So now you may have a better idea of the difference between persuasive stories and dramatic stories. But I bet if you have heard that you're going to tell a persuasive story, it needs to be a hero's journey story. Uh, Nathan, you already brought that up before, but let's look at that idea some more. And I'll show you why I think it's wrong. So the hero's journey is a phrase originated by scholar Joseph Campbell about 75 years ago. It's a very powerful concept, and it works great for feature films and many novels. But when it comes to persuasion stories, there are a couple of problems. First, the hero's journey form is complicated and tricky to master. Secondly, it has many moving parts, and it takes a great deal of knowledge, practice, and skill to create a successful hero's journey story. Nevertheless, for some reason, there are people out there, including people who should know better, who say the hero's journey is the only kind of story you should use in persuasion. Let me show you why this is a ridiculous idea. Remember, the hero's journey is about creating compelling fantasy. But let's take this down to real life. Suppose you're at a restaurant. We'll call it Marty's Premium Steakhouse. Now, I'm going to present two scenarios. The first one involves the use of the hero's journey on the part of the server. You ask the server about the filet. Boom, the lights go out. A spotlight washes across his face. There's heroic music in the background. Then your server begins speaking ominously to you in a deep baritone. Our filet is intimately tied up with what happened to Marty, the restaurant owner. At age five, he was orphaned and sent to live with his aunt and uncle. When 9-11 happened, he was deeply moved by the real heroes of the day, the firefighters. From that point forward, Marty dreamed of becoming a fireman. But at age 14, he was kidnapped by a gang of outlaw restaurant owners, completely ripped away from the life he knew. Marty was held prisoner for five years by these people. His journey into the culinary underworld was brutal, practically indentured servitude, strange customs and rituals. But the thing is, these outlaws really knew how to cook a steak. Breaking away from them was a big challenge, though. You're thinking, this is fascinating, but I didn't know they had dinner theater at this restaurant. And what was I going to order anyway? Well, that was a little much, wasn't it? Mm, that was... That was a great hero's journey story. It didn't make me want to eat or buy a steak, though. Bingo. Let's try again, this time with a persuasion story approach. You ask the server about the filet, and your server gets this almost conspiratorial look on his face. You must be a true connoisseur, because only people like that ask about the filet first thing, he says with a wink. It's our most tender steak, and I'll tell you a secret. This is the steak that's the chef's favorite, not only to cook, but when it's time for his dinner break, he'll ask for a filet himself if one's available. Marty, our owner, is famous among all the restaurant owners in town, mostly because of his filet, but also the paces he puts the meat guys through to get the first cut of their best steaks every day. I guess they don't like the pressure, but he keeps them in business, so they put up with it. That's a little better, isn't it? Because by now your mouth is watering. You can't wait for your filet. Persuasion stories are simple. They don't create a special world like the hero's journey stories. 
persuasion stories exist in this world. They are persuasive, but they are based on reality, not fantasy. Okay, so am I saying never to use a hero's journey story in a persuasion situation? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying to be selective. And whatever you do, don't automatically default to it. Consider other options. However, there are a few situations where a carefully condensed version of the hero's journey will work. For example, if you're selling a product to help people with romantic relationships. People often go through this emotional roller coaster in their own lives when it comes to romance. And because a slimmed down hero's journey mirrors that roller coaster experience, it can work big time in copy. Also, an even more drastically slimmed down hero's journey that jumps from the problem to the solution pretty fast can work. And most people just call that a simple problem solution story. And it is one of the 25 types in my book. Uh, I was just thinking about the Mac story, and that was definitely a story that had components from the hero's journey. But like you said, it was a problem and then a solution story, a problem agitates st solution story. So uh, I, I get that you're saying don't just get rid of the idea of hero's journeys, but it's not the only one. And if you really want to make it work, there's ways to make it work that don't have to involve every single step of the process. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I say in my book, and I got this from Gene Schwartz, um, that, that talk he gave at Rodale that, that is not officially published anywhere, but sort of floating around the internet. He talked about assembling copy. And so from that, I thought about puzzle pieces. A lot of times these persuasion stories are little puzzle pieces, but it might be better to have a persuasion story than a bullet point. It might be better to have a persuasion story than an outright claim or a subhead because those things get glossed over and a story just draws people in. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's look at something else. Remember the famous Wall Street Journal letter, the direct mailing that brought in $2 billion to Dow Jones and Company, which was then the publisher of the Wall Street Journal? It was the highest grossing ad of all time, at least as far as tracked response goes. And Denny Hatch investigated and proved that. Now, you pretty much know the story from the Wall Street Journal letter. One day, two men meet at a 25-year college reunion. The men are pretty much alike, except in one respect. One of them is a department manager at a Midwestern manufacturing company, and the other is president of that same company. The letter implies that the difference is that the president had been reading the Wall Street Journal for the last 25 years, and the poor schmuck, who is only a department manager, hadn't been reading it. That's it. They show up at a picnic after 25 years. One guy is president, the other guy isn't. End of story by the Wall Street Journal. Okay, so one of my mentors challenged me on this. Isn't that a hero's journey story? I thought that was a good question, and I'm going to share what I emailed back to him. It's not for a good number of reasons, just to cite a few reasons. If it were a hero's journey, the man who became president would have had to start by going on a journey into a special world where he encountered obstacles and learned lessons. And at curtain two, as they call it in Hollywood, which is the end of act two, he would need to have an all is lost moment. One possible such crisis, his marriage would need to be falling apart. The board would be trying to get him fired. Fire ants would be plaguing his apartment, etc. Then, maybe who knows, an article in the journal would have given him a stock repurchase plan idea that miraculously would have extinguished the fire ants, rekindled his marriage, and regained warm regard for him from the board. And he would emerge triumphant, inspiring CEOs everywhere to take care of the means of production and increase their book value or something. Well, nothing like that happened in the Wall Street Journal letter. There, two guys showed up 25 years later and one happened to be president. My mentor got the point and agreed with me, but then he told me I should write that story, I guess as a novel or send it to Hollywood. Um, good idea, but no thanks, Don. Okay. Anyway, you can see 
how that story would have had investors cheering like crazy, but probably would not have sold $2 billion worth of subscriptions to the journal. Okay, so I've written this book called The Persuasion Story. Oh, I'll, I'll stop before I do my summary. So, yeah. Anything? No, I think that would make a great movie, though. <laughs> You guys got to stop. I'm not going to be a screen. <laughs> I tried that once. It did not work out. Um, but thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think it, it's a, I think it's, I wrote it about as sarcastically as I could. I don't know why you think it would be. I'm just saying, compared to what Hollywood's putting out nowadays, it'd probably be a top 10 movie. <laughs> yeah, but then I'd have to be a scab and cross a picket line and my okay. grandpa was a teamster. I can't do it. Okay. Um, all right. Never mind. Uh, Refresh. Okay. Um, <laughs> clear the palette. All right. In the book, we cover 25 different types of stories in six chapters. Here's a short summary of those six chapters, which are more than half of the whole book. Origin stories, which build confidence by showing how a person's or a company's background makes them solid and worth doing business. And I have four specific types of origin stories. One is discovery story. Um, one is more of a a little bit of an adventure. It's not a hero's journey story, but it's it's about the you know credentials and qual. Anyway, there and they're very specific. I have like step by step templates. Okay, two stories. The second group of, of stories is stories about your prospect's pain, which build trust by showing you understand the dilemma your prospect is in, uh, creating valuable empathy. That's probably what the guy did at the uh, ticket counter. I I think. Since I made it up, I guess I know what he did. Okay. Uh, three stories that predict the future, competing a compelling word picture of how much better your prospect's future can be. Uh, those are the ones you have to be careful with because I got three letters for you, FTC. <laughs> uh, the fourth one, um, group is reassurance stories. And these are probably the most effective way to deal with early doubts and worries that come up. And they always come up when a prospect is really interested. Mm -hmm. um, then number five, stories that explain. And these are stories that walk the fine line between interesting and neutral explanations that um, put a prospect defenses. See, when I first started learning to uh, sell, before I even learned copywriting, I was turned, taught, you know, sell now, educate later. In other words, you know, don't be a blabbermouth salesman. You'll never sell anything. And then when I started writing copy, uh, I learned the more you tell, the more you sell. Mm -hmm. So this is a way of, of mitigating that difference. Um, uh, if you can tell explanation stories that are interesting, let me show you how to do that then you can persuade as well as explain. And finally, stories that build trust, that organize credentials, reviews, expert endorsements, and case histories into powerful persuasion tools that eliminate last minute doubts on the part of your prospect. So we put an Amazon link in the show notes so you can get a book uh, yourself. And this book will change your copy and really improve all your sales efforts for the better. Yeah, and I wanna say one of, I I'm all in on using AI to help write my sales copy. One of the things that I've seen it struggle with a lot is all of the stuff that's in this book. It feels like this book came at the perfect time for copywriters who want an edge that those of us like me who are cheating and using AI to help, uh, this mixed with that, I think gives me an edge over everybody else. But uh, I think that this is one of the, one of the things that AI is not going to be able to do for you right now. So you need to learn this stuff if you want to stay competitive. Yeah, I, I just came up with an alternative subtitle. Um, the last remaining role for humans in copywriting. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd be that hyperbolic about it, but no. a year from now, you might be telling the truth. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just keep it in my hip pocket. How's that? <laughs> nice. Okay. So if you want to check out the book, like I said, I got access to it about a month ago, two months ago, 
by the time this recording is released. I loved it. it, quickly became one of my favorite books on copywriting and I felt like there was so much in there that is just not covered by all of the copywriting books out there. So I can't endorse this book enough and if you want to check it out, head over to the show notes for this particular episode over at copywriterspodcast.com. David, any final words before we're out of here? Um, no, um, just that writing this book took twice as long and was twice as hard as I thought. And, and I'm glad because, um, I think it's, it was very fulfilling for me and I believe it's going to make a difference for a lot of people. Nice. And what's the name of the book again? Yeah. It's the persuasion story code. Persuasion story code. Okay. Again, links in the show notes page over at copywriters podcast.com. And until next time, we will catch you later. Catch you later.